Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. I'm Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. Since 2016, the international trade and finance market witnessed a flood of new blockchain projects and cryptocurrencies entering the market, all part of a wider vision to digitize and transform trade. Blockchain has been frequently touted as the solution for bridging the 1.5 trillion US dollar trade finance gap. Technology for trade finance is hard and blockchain offers potential for enabling trust, transparency and security in the 9 trillion US dollar open account trade finance space. We heard from Nitin Gower last week at the ICC Banking Commission's annual meeting. Nitin is the director of IBM Digital Asset Labs. With over 16 years of experience at IBM, Nitin is no short of a pioneer in enterprise blockchain technology and strategy. So without further ado, here is Nitin joining us from Austin, Texas. Hi, Nitin. Thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast. Hi, and thank you for having me. So Elevator Pitch, in no more than 30 seconds, tell us a little bit more about yourself and IBM Digital Asset Labs. Yeah. So, of course, blockchain is a disruptive technology, and me and my team are involved with working with clients from design, concept design to implementation and eventually production. And so in addition to establishing blockchain networks for our clients, me and my team are heads down focused on not only understanding the co-creation elements of the blockchain platform, but also understanding the notion of digital assets that includes asset tokenization and some of the financial systems tied to these digital assets in the network. So that's, in short, summary and it will summarize the body of work that me and my team does. Very exciting. What does a typical day look like for you then at Digital Asset Labs? That's really interesting, Dipesh, because just like blockchain networks, our work doesn't end. So there's no typical day. I think it's a constant catch up with the industry. There are a lot of changes and evolutionary changes actually happening in the industry from a technology point of view. There are innovations happening in every single enterprise trying to consume blockchain, whether it's cost transformation or creating new business models. And a challenging part of our work is to keep up with that evolution, be it technology or the adoption of technology by the industries. But in most cases, we spend a lot of time in talking to clients, understanding some of the industry-specific requirements and trying to morph those requirements into a blockchain network and figuring as to what is the right technology design, technology choices, and creating a choice framework for our clients that leads to a meaningful adoption and an economic viable solutioning from blockchain perspective for our clients. And so that's typically the focus of the teams that I have formed in the past, which is the blockchain labs, but also the digital asset labs that works now closely with the blockchain labs in IBM. Thanks, Nathan. So let's start with the basics. Trade is complicated and so are supply chains. Technology is continuing to improve operations, infrastructure, and the exchange of data, which I believe are really key components to global trade. At a very high level, please can you tell us some of the main applications of blockchain and trade finance and why this offers more potential than APIs and the current tech solutions that are out there? Right. No, I think that's a really pertinent point. And as we discussed at ICC last week, international trade has tripled as a share of global GDP since 45, in, since 1945. And generating a sort of an annual revenue of trade financing is about, I think, 50 billion from a US perspective. But in, in general, I think we begin to look into inefficiencies from the way trade is dealt with, right? For example, Today's international trade has enormous amount of inefficiencies and risk. There are an average of 12 parties, 27 plus documents. There's little automation. And you start finding silos of not just data, but also silos of these different intermediaries who are working on very specific sort of elements of trade and related trade finance 
flows. So the intent of blockchain is not only to distill down and using technology to induce transparency and eventually trying to bring the digitization and automation in the system, but also treat the elements in trade finance as things of value, which is dealing with some of the artifacts in the trade finance work that is leading to this inefficiency and risk that we often talk, you know, talk about is how do we apply technology meaningful way to tokenize the movement of things of value, which is essentially goods. And in many cases, the ultimate last mile, which is the settlement piece of it, which is movement of goods and money in return, which eventually leads to the overall input and conduit uh, into global economy. So I think what we have looked into from a trade solution perspective is to be able to amalgamate the finance, the logistics, the compliance pieces of it, and remove inefficiencies by addressing the issue of time and trust. Uh, And these two constructs have enormous implication in many industries, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. We spoke last time about it. We heard from that in your book. So you really th- see trade as three layers, logistics, trade, and regulatory framework, and you know, essentially the, the holy grail of truly digital trade. However, in order to solve global trade issues, these three layers need to work together. Can you expand a bit more on this and and explain how IBM and perhaps some of the initiatives that you're embarking on are really helping bridge these gaps and make the three layers work together? Oh, it's brilliant. And I'll tell you this, when we started this journey about four and a half years back, we looked closely at this. We did work with a lot of financial institutions as a starting point. And then we realized some of the tenets of blockchain, which is trade, trust, ownership, transactionality, as the foundational element. And as we broke down these processes and to understand the inefficiencies, the risks imposed, not just by currency fluctuation, but also fraud that's in the system and eventually going after the cost element of the, of the industry per se, we realized that there are three interoperating layers here. One layer is the movement of goods, which is, again, dealing with trade logistics in terms of what it entails sort of moving the goods and dealing with the various regulatory and port authorities in the world as the goods transfer from various ports and various countries. And then eventually overlaying that layer is the trade finance layer, which is again the banking function, because in many cases you have the various sourcing elements and the financial function of these various financial institutions, which are globally located and dispersed, for them to be able to understand the financial risks and dealing with the regulatory, you know, you know, the regulatory forces that go with the global movement of money per se, which is cross-border movement of money and, and the banking regulation that govern that element. And then eventually, the last layer, which is up on top of all this stuff, is around overall compliance and regulation. And in many cases, it's not just about regulation of the financial system, but also regulation of import-export and various certification that different countries require. One thing we realized that the language, the documentation requirements, the players in each of these layers are a bit different, which means that we're dealing with three different distinct layers as they have to sort of synchronize their function between these three layers. And that was one of the main reasons why we saw an enormous amount of inefficiency in addition to the inefficiencies caused by lack of digitization in the industry. And so we had a formulated point of view. And so we realized that it becomes enormously difficult for us to be able to flatten the entire business process and create one massive network uh, powered by blockchain only because of the players and their language and their association with what we call as a digital asset is different. For instance, in the trade logistics world, your goods, your containers, and associated documentation may be treated as digital assets, whereas the layer above, which is a financial layer, essentially would treat various things like bill of lading and payments as an asset. And the language and the parties that are dealing with these asset types uh, may be different. And then eventually we have the compliance and regulatory layer, which treats, again, has its own language, has its own players. And so I think one realization was really quick after a year and a half of research was that it may be best for us to address them individually because that way we are able to solve a point solution, be able to take the business language and the business sort of understanding and be able to digitize some of those elements. And eventually, as these three layers are being digitized, find a way to link these layers together to create one single sort of a seamless workflow, which will eventually solve the industry problems. And so 
In order to address those efforts, what we've done is we've looked into Trade Lens, uh, which is essentially our initiative with some of the global logistic players like Maersk and Zim to be able to digitize and make that information available for the various systems that includes the port authorities, that includes the financial systems, and also working with some of the industry players that are global sort of phenomenon like VTrade, Voltran, our emerging trade finance networks, which is pretty much driven by the financial sort of use cases. And by linking the two together, we're doing a few things. We are not only providing an information layer, but we're also providing instrumentation of these digital assets in these different systems for them to be able to de-risk some of the elements by providing better visibility, better transparency, and then creating newer business model for financial systems like supply chain financing and providing fractional financing depending on uh, the risk and depending on the movement of these goods in the system. And by linking these two together, I think we're taking a first step in maintaining abstraction modularity between these networks, but at the same time, ensuring there's a seamless flow of information between these different systems, leading to a much more better transparent systems around it. So I'll take a pause at that, depends to see if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. It's very good to take a helicopter view of the industry and break it apart into those three layers because, as we know, it's such a complex, vast industry. It's very good to have a think about those elements as individual pieces and address very specific laser-focused parts of the problem. So going into a bit more detail about with regards to trade lens and also Hyperledger Fabric through WeTrade and Voltron, have we moved yet from proof of concept to live transaction in both of these layers? Yeah, no, I think we've done some substantial amount of work. Of course, because these are new asset types in the system and there are a lot of integration that would have to be done it has taken a little longer than we had expected, but I think we begin to see signs of some live transactions and we have done some of the live transaction we trade, as you may have heard in the news, I think Voltran did live transaction. And I do want to differentiate the notion of live transactions with the te- underlying technology layer. And I think that in many cases, you may have diverse technology platforms. And I think IBM's focus and our support has been with Hyperledger Fabric as an open source open community-driven you know, platform. And you know, R3 has Corda, which is also open source platform. So I think the beauty is that while these different platforms may be fueling these different networks, the interoperability between network is the key, right? So we've seen live transactions in WeTrade network. We've seen live transaction in Voltron network. And I think there's an effort in the industry to be able to connect these networks to create a truly global network which I think is a really important, really important element that we all as industry professionals should aspire to achieve because it's really impossible for us to create one single flat network across the globe for many reasons, for jurisdictional reasons, for local geographical preferences, the competing forces that are at play. There are many reasons why we don't expect to have one single network. However, I think we do aspire to have these regional networks and eventually connecting them to form one massive global network. That makes sense. And you've answered my next question. So we have numerous consortiums developed on different cryptocurrencies. I guess the idea of the node to node based fabric platform, which which IBM have developed for WeTrade and the point transfer or data transfer by Corda, but they aren't interoperable at the moment. And as far as I'm aware, it's very difficult to make them talk to each other. And it seems like the banks have taken sides with either consortium. So in your opinion, what's the difference between the two? And secondly, how can they talk to each other in the case of corporate to multi-bank scenario, I wanting to trade cross-border using DLT? So that's a really involved and deeper question, but let me address this in a few ways, right? While We see these sort of networks globally emerge based on different technology platforms. And there are two challenges. One challenge is the technology interoperability, which is the ability for me to move an asset from one network to another network and having the right technology set to support the movement of asset while preserving the integrity of the digital asset, whether the digital asset happens to be a letter of credit, bill of lading, container-based information, and so on and so forth. Second thing is the readiness from business to be able to trust as the asset moves across the network. So while Hyperledger and Corda happens to be on two distinct technology platforms, 
I think there are a lot of industry initiatives that are trying to focus on what we call as bridging technologies, which is relying upon either a business, let's say a global bank, which happens to be part of WeTrade and happens to be part of Voltra Network, can act as a bridge, which basically then becomes accountable for the assets accountability as it's providing its access to both networks or relying on the technology solution, which I think we've seen that with some of the protocols and some of the technology set developed by likes of Polkadot, Cosmos, Aeon type networks to create a bridge which allows an asset to be locked in one network and create a new asset and provide some sort of linkability. And this bridging protocol essentially maintains the tangibility as well as the integrity of the asset. So be it a technology solution or be it a solution that's driven by the association of the various financial institutions in the network, I think provides us an avenue to link these networks together. So that's an important distinction that we have to make is technology solution versus an a industry-led solution by association of these financial institutions with these different networks. But the underlying thematic element of this conversation is clear. I think we do need to be able to connect these networks, not just for the time, people, technology that each of these banks expend in verification validation process of these paperwork that's involved, but at the same time, ensuring that the asset is fairly transparent in the network, leading to de-risking some of the business flows that the banks have to deal with, which I think is good for the banks involved, but it's also good for the various players in terms of the cost savings that can be passed on to the end consumer, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Good. And it's very important for competition within our space to drive these innovations and these breakthroughs to allow for interoperability. So let's move away from the different types of technology providers, platforms, and even consortiums. And and let's move on to talk about geography. Let's talk about Asia and Asian consortiums. There's more of a challenge given that there are more complex trade zones across different markets and different regulatory landscapes. We heard a few weeks ago, HKMA and SMA, the Singapore Monetary Authority, recently announced the formation of a new consortium. What's happened here and why is this an exciting and also relevant move for IBM? No, I think you bring up a really good point. And since you bring up Asia, I think I'm, my vantage point from trade is truly global trade. I think a lot of initiatives driven from what we label as GCG countries, which is the Greater China Group, which is Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China. In terms of the trading block, we start looking at ASEAN as a trading block. And of course, in the Americas, we see it, a lot of trade activity within South America and North America. So there are trading blocks which are leveraging their competencies, leveraging their natural resources, leveraging what they have over time have used their resources at hand to distinguish themselves in terms of what they have to offer to the world. So HKMA and MAS example that you cite is a perfect example of that, where MAS has a mandate in terms of Singapore being a really small country and a lot of dependency of the economy is on trade and eventually they're morphing that into creating financial services, is trying to understand as to what role they can play in this new evolution of providing a conduit to financial services by linking up various trade systems. And HKMA, again, from Hong Kong as a trading port and its association with a lot of emerging sort of Chinese businesses, you realize that there is a sense of connectivity that's needed between the two as the trading goes. But at the same time, I think from GDCN, which is the initiative that has some linkages to One Belt, One Road or BRI initiatives, It really is coming together in terms of making Asia as one trading block and providing not just a technology platform, but providing an avenue for these financial institutions to connect with each other seamlessly as the trading happens between these two blocks. So I think it's, to me, it's a culmination of a lot of years worth of effort in terms of creating a platform-centric approach by both of these sort of central banks as a way to create a dominant trading block for the world. And so a lot of initiative for us as a technology provider, I think whenever these platforms emerge and over time, we've seen that with clearing houses in the past, we've seen that with exchanges in the past, which have truly transformed various industries. I think we view this as a significant approach for us to play a role 
as a technology provider and bring our acumen and our talent to the table to be able to help build, manage, and run these systems on behalf of these consortiums that are emerging. And so I think it's a significant play for us from what's happening with BRI and related platforms like HKMA and what, uh, what GDCN has been proposed by MAS and, and HKMA in the region. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Very, very interesting that we've seen a real difference in the development of these technologies in the Western Hemisphere and GDC. And, and actually, that's something that we really look forward to, especially when you've got big global banks who provide liquidity into both of these markets, really taking a hold on the market and, and actually seeing which consortiums, which platforms they invest in and what they develop. True. And I think you hit on a really important point. I oftentimes say this when we distill down all the use cases and all the complexity with technology, blockchain is aiming to solve the issue of time and trust, right? And these two constructs have implications. Time it takes for the goods to move. Oftentimes time it takes for the financial transactions to complete so the goods can eventually be delivered to the end party and the risk that goes with it. And if you were to compress that and improve liquidity and move some of these digital assets, whether it's digital fiat, and it only improves liquidity and has an enormous impact on the economy of many of the countries where oftentimes it might take two, three, or even a week to move money. So improving liquidity in the system, I think from a financial perspective, is the end goal, right? And that end goal is manifested in many different forms where we are trying to have better visibility and better transparency, eventually leading to the last mile problem, which is eventually moving, moving money. So moving goods and moving money is far foundation to any economic activity. And I think blockchain as a foundational technology will help build us a better platform that facilitates these movements of goods and monies across the world. I think it's very important for consortiums to remember the fact that, as you quite rightly mentioned, goods and the movement of money, which does translate into the movement of data, is at the heart of trade and trade finance. I guess moving on from that, what are you most excited about in terms of digital trade at, at IBM Digital Asset Labs? And what do you think the next few years look like for both IBM and also trade finance with respect to digitization using DLT? Just provide what I've learned over the years and that's led to me forming an opinion on this piece. I think the most exciting piece for me, right? Because the industry in general has done a lot of work with technologies like IoT and data analytics, tracking and tracing with GPS systems and so on and so forth to provide better visibility and better transparency and tracking and tracing of goods. So containers, there's enough technology out there that allows you to tag containers and provide in a systemic way to ensure there's locking and there's the lock is broken, then that leads to inspection and, and so on and so forth. So that has been evolving over time. And all we're doing in trade logistics space is tokenizing some of those elements and putting them on a blockchain network, which allows the various parties to connect and, and collaborate. So all that is coming together really well, and it's building upon what we've learned in the past. But I think from a digital asset perspective, what's the most interesting piece for me is digital fiat, essentially the work that we are doing with financial institutions in introduction of stablecoin and related business models in working with central banks in creating tokenized fiat, essentially digital fiat in the system, which solves the core issue of liquidity, as you mentioned, is cutting short the time of settlement that is very much needed in the, you know, in the space. So that to me is not only challenging the status quo of current systems, but also giving us a hope that it's not just all about cryptocurrency in the system. It's not about true decentralization, but using blockchain in a meaningful way for permission entities to come together and use these instruments meaningfully to be able to not only flatten the business systems, but give birth to new business models, whether it's creating liquidity for the systems or related sort of supply chain and trade finance activities that are yet to be seen, right? So that is really, really exciting for me. And so another exciting part for me is Ability for me to be able to, I wouldn't use the word interoperability, but provide an inter-blockchain asset exchange mechanism, which is ability for me to link movement of these containers and these goods and using these containers as digital asset in the system, using bill of lading, letter of credit as two sort of the opposing end of these documentary requirements as digital asset 
thereby eliminating fraud, eliminating some of the long business processes that are there, and flattening that system to create a seamless, seamless process that the world trusts, right? Again, solving the issue of trust by applying technology. And those two things to me are really, really exciting, interesting, that whatever work we're doing at a technology level will help us change the world for better, I think. Thanks, Nitin. That's very, very inspirational. And I guess the idea and, and the huge explosion of digital fiat and central banks with regards to stable coin to really build those levels of trust on a, on a digital level is, is so important. And we should really be paying attention, keeping an eye on how that develops over time. Also, as you mentioned, the idea of tokenizing real financial products that exist and, and account for the large majority of both open account and also receivables in, in the world of trade finance. I think it's very important to keep that at the heart of the problem and look at opportunities around digitizing that. So thank you very much, Nitin. It was really great to have you here today on the podcast. And I know you'll be speaking next week in Toronto So really look forward to hearing from you and thank you so much for having us today. Likewise, uh, thank you so much for including me and looking forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.